So meanwhile, Mr. Tuhin, join us. So welcome you all for being a wonderful part of this panel discussion. So we have a uh, you know, quick introduction before we start for the panel discussion as well. So uh, this is the panel discussion for maximize potential of IP through licensing, the next era of IP monetization. So we have in this session Ms. Persis Hudiwala, Chief Manager Legal, Reliance Big Entertainment Private Limited. Mr. K. Satish Kumar, Global Head, Legal and Chief Data Protection Officer from Remco Systems. Mr. Tuhin Singhare, Council Intellectual Property, Every Rension Corporation. Ms. Renju Harikumar, Vice President, APEC Intellectual Property Accenture. Mr. Kareem Elhali, Legal Director, Oracle System Private Limited. Dr. Sheetal Chopra uh, from India, Lead IPR Advocacy Erickson gonna also join us, but due to some personal issues, she is not here to in, in the panel discussion. And finally, Mr. Scott E. Skender, he's a worldwide patent uh, uh, engineer, lead IBM patent licensing. So welcome you all for being a wonderful part of the session, and I'm looking forward to a great session with your end as well. So now, this is the session. Over to you, Ms. Persis. Finally, start the session. Uh, hello everyone, it gives me an immense pleasure to be one of the panelists amongst you all. And uh, we have the lawyers from the best of the best field which is pharma, IT, manufacturing and I am myself from the ent entertainment sector. Today we will talk about how the IP has been created, protected and then eventually what steps at each uh, sector the company takes to monetize it. So uh, I will allow uh, each one of you to introduce yourselves. So we can begin with uh, Kareem. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kareem Nelly. Yeah. Thank you, Persis, for the introduction. Uh, I am uh, been an IP practitioner for almost uh, 20 years now. Uh, I have started my, my passion for IP when a technology transfer was introduced in the local laws in Egypt back in 1998, which pushed me to pursue my master degree in intellectual property in the US and then forward working on IP for different sectors, the pharmaceutical, the agriculture, the IT, the entertainment, the telecom, then lately the technology based. Uh, my views on the seminar are my only views. They don't represent my company or anyone else. Uh, it's just I want to contribute to this uh, very <clears throat> insightful uh, event by giving uh, tips and sessions on uh, IP and particularly with the transformation that we're watching now and the technology evolution compared to the legislation in play. Okay, over to you, Renju. Hi, everyone. I'm Renju. I'm currently Hi. working with Accenture as a uh, vice president, uh, taking care of uh, APAC region. Uh, so in my current role, so I have the responsibility of developing an IP strategy, uh, including IP growth strategy as well as monetization strategy for our APAC region. Um, so I have been like uh, Karim, so I am also in this field for almost 20 years now. Um, so I'm basically an electronics engineer. So before joining Accenture, so I was working with uh, G Healthcare for almost 10 years. And then before that, I was practicing with some of the prominent IP firms in India. So I'm so excited to be part of this and uh, sharing the screen with you all. We are excited to ha have you. Uh, over to you, uh, Satish. Yeah. Uh, hello, be... everyone. Hi. Yes. Sorry, Satish. Hi, yeah. Hello, everyone. It was a bit of struggle to get in. <laughs> okay. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I am Satish. I carry over 20 years of uh, experience, uh, majorly in IT uh, field. Right now, I am the Global Head Legal and Chief Data Protection Officer of uh, Ramco System. Uh, previous to that, some of the major companies uh, that I was in was uh, Polaris and HCL Technology, and I was, uh, you know, uh, I was taking care of uh, the legal in uh, these companies. So IT strategy being one of the verticals in the legal uh, was quite interesting. 
so uh, today we are going to have a very interesting session i believe uh, especially monetization of ip um, so, so for sustenance of any corporate you know monetization is quite critical so absolutely we all are going to uh, you know contribute uh, some strategy or uh, where we can take uh, the best uh, among the you know the best uh, of you know some of the best industry practices back home and try to implement uh, within our organization Thank you. Sure. Over to you, Scott. Yeah, hi, I'm Scott Schneider. I'm the Worldwide Patent Engineering Lead um, here at IBM. I have about 25 years of experience in software engineering. And uh, the last 10 years of my career, I switched over uh, into the IBM Intellectual Property Organization. And uh, my primary job is a technical job. Uh, and uh, secondarily, uh, business development. Uh, Basically, my goal is to find um, patents in the IBM patent portfolio uh, that could apply to other companies so I can help uh, the team monetize uh, our patents and uh, bring more money in uh, to IBM. Great. Uh, Tuhin? Yes, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, <laughs> everyone. So. I am uh, Tuhin Singharai, IP Counsel for Average Edition Corporation. Average Edition Corporation is a California-based uh, company. Uh, we got established somewhere in 1930. And uh, we are into pressure sensitive adhesive and packaging material, uh, RFID tags, uh, retroreflectives, and intelligent label. So in uh, some of the segment, we are wall leader uh, in uh, packaging materials uh, in uh, Ultra high frequency uh, uh, RFID tags. We are wall reader. So uh, coming back to my role, I am IP counsel. I am handling uh, uh, the IP procurement part uh, for different region and different labs across the globe, uh, as well as also participate in uh, IP transactional agreement. Pre Hello. I think there's some connectivity issue here. Okay, so finally I'll in, in, introduce myself. I'm Porsche. So I'm the Chief Legal of, Officer at Reliance Bank Entertainment since last uh, four and a half years. I carry almost uh, 15 years of work, at, work experience. And uh, I've always been in, been in the entertainment sector. And uh, I've studied in LA, and then I came back to India, and uh, now I'm here. So we basically develop IP, and then uh, we monetize it. Yeah. So I think we've lost uh, Tuhin again. Should we start uh, with you, yeah. Scott? Um, so Percy is one more point. So I just want to mention that so all views are my personal views and it's not representing my company. Thank you. Yeah, that's for all of us. <laughs> sure. But just for the records. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So let's begin with Scott. Uh, Scott, can you just uh, speak about uh, uh, patent monetization at IPM? Yes, of course. And once again, thanks for having me on the panel. Uh, actually, these, these views aren't my own. The company told me exactly what to say. No, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> these, are my, these are my views. Um, so at, at IBM, uh, we have a very large uh, patent licensing and assignment program. Um, we do, I think, a fairly good job at monetizing our portfolio. Uh, IBM... Uh, spends about six billion or so, five to six billion a year. Uh, we uh, invest in R and D, research and development, and to help support that cost, uh, we try to make the most out of the IP that we have, uh, mainly patents, um, but also uh, technology assets, source code. Um, there's all, uh, some small divestitures that we do in my organization that help uh, bring money in to uh, support our R and D. Um, my 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 main job, as I mentioned earlier, is patent monetization. So I'm specialized in patents, and uh, we have. Um, uh, I work mainly outside of North America, um, uh, in India, Japan, China, Korea, 
and uh, try to monetize our, our uh, patent portfolio. Uh, I have a, like I said earlier, I have a technical role. Uh, my job is to uh, study um, other companies um, and they might, how they might be infringing IBM's patents. Um, and uh, usually once we find companies that might be infringing our IP or our patents, uh, then we try to set up, a, you know, a plan of how we can collaborate with that company to try to establish a cross-license agreement between IBM and that other company. Um, there's, you know, as I said, one of the reasons we're doing this is to help fund our R&D um, and, you know, leverage the assets that we have. We have about 9,000 patents that are granted every year. We have about 65,000 patents worldwide. Every year we're granted another 9,000 or so. Um, so we have uh, many, many patents. Uh, the second reason we do this is for freedom of action. Uh, so not only to monetize our portfolio, but also to protect us so we can practice, uh, you know, operate worldwide with less worry about infringing other people's um, patents uh, because we have a cross license back to their portfolio. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that's the two main purposes of what we do with our patent portfolio. Um, and that's sort of how I how I work on it. And how do you go about generally creating a patent? Uh, yeah, so I'm also on the, so my main job is on the end of the patent spectrum. You know, after the patent is granted, uh, what do we do with the patent? How do we make money out of the patent? Um, I also work secondarily um, in the front part with the, the IP and the patent creation phase. Um, I'm a ma uh, so-called master inventor at IBM. I have about 45 patents that have been granted with some pending. Uh, right now. And um, so that's a, another one of the, my jobs, sort of, uh, it's not my full-time job, but everybody at IBM is encouraged to invent. So I work with many people that that are submitting many patent applications at, at hopes that we get them granted. Um, so that's that's another thing that I do in my, uh, in my uh, uh, daily work. So your daily work um, is also drafting and uh, looking at the contracts for patents? Well, so um, not drafting, but actually just coming up with the ideas, you know, the, I'm, a, I'm the actual inventor, but I do work. Um, I'm also on the invention development board as a technical resource. Um, so I work with the attorneys on the front end, uh, to help vet the ideas and the technology areas that I'm, a um, that I'm an expert in. Um, so there's certain areas in mobile software development where I help, uh, vet the inventions that are coming in from other IBMers within the company and, we try to a lot. We try to make sure we're aligning the ideas that are coming in uh, to how we're going to monetize them on the back end. So, if you don't have an alignment between those two, um, since we have so many patents, there could be uh, there's big issues. Uh, so, we try as much as possible to align, you know, the ideas that are coming in from the inventors uh, to where we see how we can monetize those patents, you know, three to five years from now. Okay. So we that's a we try to keep that aligned. It's very difficult with so many patents. Of course, um, 9,000 is way too much. Yeah, I mean, that's what we try to do at least. <laughs> Absolutely. OK, we'll move on to Renju. Yeah. So how does it work, uh, Renju, at your level in uh, patent monetization program? And how do um, you monetize the softwares? Right. Um, so I will kind of you know begin with so in case it's like you know if you don't have a very formal structured approach like IBM so how do we kind of you know get into the IP monetization phase? Um, so as uh, Scott mentioned historically or traditionally many companies have been filing patent application uh, from a perspective of protecting IP may not be kind of you know thinking about the monetization uh, but now it's the era so where it's like you know so we need to think. Uh, kind of you know concretely and come up with an IP monetization strategy because that's one of the kind of you know key way to generate uh, additional revenue for any organization whether it's big or small uh, so to begin with uh, so patents are filed basically for a technology not for a specific product per se right so unlike in the product industry so mostly softwares are kind of you know broad enough uh, so that might cut across different um, different products it may not be kind of you know, confined to one particular product so there may not be a one-on-one -on -one mapping between patents and uh, the product or the software offering that we have 
So the first step is to identify your portfolio. So what you have basically in terms of IP filing, in terms of you know your products and solutions and offerings. So develop a correlation between these two. I think that's quite critical. Uh, as I said, some some places possibly we may not have kind of you know thought through a well structured monetization program. But uh, this is for the smaller organization where possibly they didn't have this. So understanding your portfolio, having a correlation between your product versus an IP is quite critical. So where what goes in terms of patent protection. Um, so once we have, and that's again, so it's quite easy for to do the product forms because they might have a one-on-one -on -one mapping, but may not be same for the consulting firms or the uh, smaller companies or software industry per se. Once we have this correlation identified, so I think it's again critical for us to understand what's the value that each of these patents is bringing to the table. Um, so again, so for product industry, it might be slightly different because uh, they can always do the correlation. Okay, so this particular feature has been protected by this particular patent. So it's easy for them to kind of you know characterize it to that particular patent and say that, okay, because I am the market leader, so I have this functionality, so it's critical for me to protect it or monetize it. But in software industry, it's again, so how we are talking about the value associated with that software. Uh, many a times it may be the outcome or the value. For example, it's like you know, a software might be helping you to deliver something better. So you need to, or maybe it's enhancing the productivity of the employees, or maybe the turnaround time has been increased. So it's, it's in the form of value than kind of, you know, the actual feature or functionality. So based, so that's on, the, based on the value, uh, you define or diff, uh, structure different models. Yes, exactly. So okay. we're coming to that. But it's not kind of, you know, one form will fit in software industry because it's always based on values, right? So it's like, you know, maybe values and especially the client delivery as well. Which model, I think, Adish will talk more possibly on this. So how we basically kind of, you know, come up with different models to address and um, how different kind of, you know, monetization patterns And just happen. generally, what are the different models followed? Um, so it depends one on the client and one on the specific usage. So again, so it's like, you know, it's, uh, it's hosted uh, on demands or it's like, you know, what are the different types of services or delivery models that we are following? And second is what sort of you know client appetite is there for uh, IP. So there could be different commercial models which are available. Sometimes it's an upfront. So does it depend on the cost of investment as as well? Yes, if there is a lot of a lot of consideration which needs to be not just the cost of investment, but it's like you know, how the market is there. If somebody is giving it free, of course, then you may not be able to charge a huge premium for that particular. Software, but it's like you know what are the industry standards or so how critical that software is, how we are interacting with the client, so how the client is in need of that particular software. So all these things get into the consideration. So of course, there are different models to utilize it, and many a times so it's the outcome based the structure is quite common in software industry because the nature of the value that the software is being yeah. Okay, so uh, we also have that a was very interesting to know. Yeah, sorry, Harshita. We have a question from Mr. Parag Thakre that what is your approach towards valuation of your IP assets from monetization perspective? And also from India perspective, how feasible is, is it to monetize software patents? So kindly answer the question, please. Any one of you who would like to go ahead with the question? The question is in the chat box. Yeah, so I, I can answer uh, some of those yes, questions. Please. Uh, from an, okay, so how feasible is it to monetize software patents in India? Uh, from my experience, we, we've actually been doing it at IBM maybe for 12 years now. Um, it's primarily for us licensing, uh, not selling patents, but more of a licensing patents. Um, this is for patents. And uh, we've, had, we've had very good success with many tier one and tier two IT service companies. Uh, so from our perspective, software licensing has been very good for us. Um, the other area that's very good for IBM is, um, uh, well, I guess tech li technology licensing and uh, small divestitures. So we're being able to monetize our IP 
um, to uh, many Indian IT service companies. Um, and many of these deals are, are public. You can look them up um, over the past five to eight years or so um, where we've taken products that we no longer uh, want to invest any more money in. We were able to divest them um, to some companies in India. Um, but th for the part that I work on, it's mainly uh, so uh, mainly software patent licensing. Um, it's been it's been uh, pretty successful for us. Um, I want to add one point. I want to add one point. It's mainly it's mainly you know, it's mainly U.S. patents, not Indian patents. So the way yeah. we're able to, the way we're able to. Satish, you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Scott. Maybe you can finish up. You know, no, I, I, I was just going to add that it's uh, mainly U.S. patents that um, we're able to uh, right. use to convince uh, companies to take a cross license with us um, because they're doing you know sixty five to eight. You know, 80% of their business in the U.S. These Indian IT service companies, so it's very important for them to have freedom of action um, in the U.S. Um, and uh, IBM's portfolio is about uh, there's a greater concentration in our portfolio with U.S. patents, so uh, we have a much better value proposition to the companies that we're talking to um, when we're talking about our U.S. portfolio. Okay, I hope that uh, answers Parag's query. Moving on to uh, Mr. Satish Kumar. Uh, I would like to ask yeah. you, as a software product company, how do you potentially maximize the IP? Yeah. So uh, let me start off with a, a very common caveat here. The views expressed are my own, and uh, my company does not reflect uh, or uh, does not, uh, you know, uh, support this view. So this is my personal view. So uh, to start off with, uh, yes, uh, Ramco is a product company. And, uh, uh, you know, for any product company, IP is the most critical. The biggest asset for a uh, uh, software product company is the I IP. You know, apart from the resources, uh, the IP is the most uh, critical one. So how do we monetize them? So, uh, you know, uh, monetization, uh, uh, you know, but this also goes to answering to Parag Thakre's question about monetization of uh, IP. So monetization here is not a one-time asset, you know. Uh, so we try to uh, monetize it on a regular basis. As a product company, the uh, we try to monetize the IP uh, either through the SaaS model, uh, that is the uh, you know bread and butter for us, or through the licensing uh, platform. So it can be uh, you know either one of this SaaS and licensing. So you know, let me keep it short and precise. So, and uh, the next question to you, what is the, the difference between work made for hire and licensing for IP monetization in software? It's a very different thing for me. Uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, so as I, uh, I was, as I was telling you, uh, Persis and everyone, uh, uh, here monetization is very critical. Now, when we do work for hire, basically, when we try to monetize the work for hire, we get uh, the IP is passed on to the other party. It's a customized product. It's a bespoke one, you know, where we exclusively develop the IP uh, on the request of the customer. So whatever we develop, we pass it on to the customer. So, the, you know, we are just hired for the work. So that is why we say as uh, work for hire. And it's a one-time, uh, you know, uh, monetization effort. You uh, draw, you prepare the software or you develop the software and pass it on to the customer. The monetization gets over there. Whereas uh, in the licensing platform, I have a product developed uh, which whose IP belongs to me, and now uh, I am going to monetize it on a on a recurrent basis. I uh, you know I will monetize this not just with one customer. I will monetize it with multiple customers. So the uh, the chance of monetization here uh, is tremendously high than the work for I, because the IP belongs to me. Uh, I will license it to customer A, customer B, customer C, and customer D across the chain. And uh, you know uh, the same product I am licensing it to multiple customer. And hence, uh, the monetization is uh, is gets to the power. Uh, it, it gets on increasing, so it gets so, on better. 
so this is the basic difference okay. for both for ad and the license so uh, you guys have a saas model and on premise model of licensing from monetization of ip could you elaborate on that yeah so 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 i had uh, told you persis about uh, work for hire and licensing now for saas and uh, licensing again you know the ip belongs to me but the way i monetize uh, is again different in saas model the monetization is month on month so month on month so it depends upon the as long as the customer is with me i keep monetizing the uh, the software every month that is uh, the saas model so i keep billing the customer uh, every month for the software for which i have the ip as the customer uses my software uh, in return i am getting compensation from the customer on a month on basis so i host the software in a cloud and give access to the customer so as long as the customer keeps using my software month on month he keeps uh, paying me that is the saas model of monetizing the ip now the licensing portion uh, see uh, here uh, again the ip belongs to me but uh, you know the licensing will uh, i will take their largest chunk into my books of account so the licensing again will be much much higher so uh, for instance uh, the saas model say 100 dollars we are billing the customer every month uh, it can be a 10000 dollar billing for uh, licensing model i bill upfront at the beginning of the contract it is like a uh, you know like a microsoft product where which you uh, give and you take upfront the money from the customer the customer will lifelong use the, it depends upon the license term it can be a perpetual license it can be a and are these license. agreements uh, also drafted at your end yeah the agreements are also drafted in line with uh, you know what uh, i am talking if the, if the license is perpetual Uh, we give the customer a perpetual, and the entire amount is upfront taken into our books and monetized it, and uh, it becomes a revenue for us. And if the customer tomorrow goes box off, it is his pain. Uh, it's his pain because I already monetized it. He cannot claim back the money from me uh, because this is a non-refundable license. And the rights go back so, to the uh, person who owns it. Uh, the yeah, the rights is rights of this IP is with me. So as long as uh, you know he is. in the saas model as long as he uses he pays me money but in the license model upfront he pays me the money so monetization is much higher in case of license than in case of saas model of course you know in license there are multiple ways of license it can be a perpetual where we upfront book the uh, monetize the money and it can be a term license also say for instance the license is for a fixed uh, term of 5 years so total revenue that we generate out of uh, uh, the license is divided by 5 and each year you book uh, the uh, revenue monetize the revenue so these are some of uh, ways of saas and the license and then you look like, after uh, the model. holistic approach towards uh, the licensing agreements execution everything yeah so uh, so basically right from structuring the deal with the client uh, so upfront when the sales team pitches into the uh, you know So the customer, the customer comes back with his requirement. Then you know we uh, align ourselves with the sales team, and uh, you know um, uh, see what the requirement of the customer is, and accordingly offer the product. Either it can be in a SaaS model, it can be a work for hire, or it can be a license model. Again, the subset of a license model is it can be a term license, perpetual it can be a perpetual license. license. Correct, correct. Okay. So these insightful. are some of the ways uh, how we monetize. Great. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Pers. Can you just uh, throw some light on uh, how does IBM uh, yes, monetize its IP? Yes, but it's echoing. Yeah, let me just uh, conventional IP practitioner. So first of all, I want to uh, address a remark to Scott that a few years back I read the book Burning the Ships. for Marshall Phillips chief legal officer ex chief legal officer of IBM and how he developed that process is a very inspiring book and i really recommend uh, for the audience to uh, read it called burning the ships by marshall phillips uh, i would as a as a conventional ip practitioner i'd like to go back to the basics so i hear always uh, the term ip ip and i want to differentiate between ip and iprs because you really cannot do anything with ip 
IP is the invention. IPR is the patent. IP is the brand. IPR is the trademark. Uh, IP is the design. IPR is the copyright. And ho hence goes forward for uh, the rest of the IPR subject matter. And I want to touch base on, base on that because you cannot monetize IP. You can actually monetize the IPRs once they graduate from the uh, process, the prosecution, etc. Now, for monetization of IPRs or what we used to call in the back days commercialization, in, in general, there are five tools to do so. One, products. Two, license in. Three, license out. And four, uh, cross-license. And then five, enforcement. Okay, so uh, in order to do that, actually, in order to adopt or monetize your IPRs, you must have a competent, trusted IP management system in place, or what we call an intellectual asset management uh, project or operation in place. And what does that do? It's, it's designed on a very old, uh, not old model, but a, a wide range of IP experts back in 2000 or 1999. They made a lot of uh, surveys, a lot of research, and they came up with a model at the time, which what we call it the value hierarchy. Okay, it's a pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid, you have what we call the cost center, and then on top you have the profit center, and then in the middle you have the enforcement, and then you have the visionary. The cost center is what most of IP practitioner uh, uh, do, which is filing patents, filing trademarks, etc. And then you jump on the cost center level where you actually start grooming your IPR, identifying the core IP from the non-core IP until you come with a model for either commercializing it through licensing or enforcement as Scott, as Scott uh, lightly touched on it, you know, by pursuing companies that are infringing on the IP and generating revenue from such pursuance. And then you have on the top the visionary, which is usually the the CEO office where they actually have what we call a competitive assessment uh, uh, team that uh, strata that analyze and research the field if it is uh, you know how they are impacting their existing patents or future patents and how can they create a strategy for that so in order to to monetize your IPR you really need to have an IP management system in place that is quite solid in order to untap the hidden value of your IPRs. And how is now, Middle East uh, with the current with technological the, evolution? With the technical developments? Yes, I'm coming to that. Thank you, Percy. Uh, and now with the te technological transformation, as we are seeing now, the cloud, AI, blockchain, all of that, uh, most of the region here in the Middle East are relying on IP laws that were issued back in 2002. And the reason that we go back to 2002 because that all acceded to the TRIPS, which is the trade-related aspect of intellectual property, uh, which is an annex to the WTO. And since they all became a member state of WTO, they had to accede to the TRIPS. So all by default, they had to have a competent, efficient, effective IPR protection system by 2002 and max. And those laws are still not updated yet, uh, given the fact that we are witnessing now a lot of debate on artificial intelligence. Who owns the, the end product of the AI application? Is it the company? Is it the AI itself? Moreover, what happens when there's a liability that arise from uh, you know, the solution or the process that was generated by the AI. All these, and now we also have the data privacy, the GDPR. So a lot of countries in the Middle East, but particularly in the UAE, are, are paying very close attention to that. There are data protection laws that came uh, into place. Uh, there are privacy laws that are coming into place to uh, complement this. But I, th I think still there is a lot to be done on the existing intellectual property legislation in order to cope with this development going forward. And uh, we can't just rely on laws that back 2002, where we were only talking about, you know, uh, limited uh, digital uh, transformation, not as now. So 
this is mainly what I wanted to touch base on, uh, give you around. Uh, Egypt just enacted a data privacy law. Uh, Saudi just enacted the cloud regulations. Oh. Uh, UAE just enacted its data privacy law as well. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Karim. Uh, the rest of the region is uh, following through quickly. And in the next two years, we will find uh, updated IPR laws in place that deals with artificial intelligence, blockchain. And we're already seeing uh, cloud regulations in place, okay. and data privacy in place that deal Wait, I think with Harshita such has evolution. to say something. Yeah. Uh, actually, Parsis, we are running up with the time and we need to conclude the session so that we can have a Q&A session with the participants. Yeah, so coming, thank you, Kareem, for such a great uh, great session and how it works in Middle East. Uh, Tuhin, coming to you, can you just quickly touch upon how do you monetize IP in your uh, company and uh, what are the methods used for it? Right. So I'll give you a general overview as per uh, my experience in pharmaceutical uh, yeah. industry and in the chemical industry. So I I think that it basically boils down to two factor uh, for a successful commercialization or monetization of your IP. Uh, namely, first is your ability to generate innovation with value and your ability to exploit the value out of those innovation. And IP licensing or IP monetization can play a role both in the IP generation as well as in the IP monetization. So if you are a uh, startup or if you are a uh, middle sized company or if you are a big company, you need to understand what is the need of the business, how you coordinate, uh, how your marketing coordinated with R&D, how your R&D is coordinated with op operation and, and what stage of technology your business lies. So is it a mature technology? It's emerging technology. So, and what is the dynamics of the market? So you face a lot of competition, your price margins are ero ero eroding and there are, the mar market is cluttered, your, your, your product is becoming commoditized. So in that case, you need to understand what is the future avenue potential you have to and what kind of product. In the agreements? Yes. So, so, so when, in, even in development of uh, innovation, you can uh, go into you know startup, utilize their patent, you buy out startup, you go to in university, you collaborate with them, you bring the technology, you sign the technology, and uh, you know uh, you hone the technology so that it is perfected for commercialization. So, and another aspect is that you know many firm in our in, in our sector they develop technology but they don't have ability to commercialize the technology or scale. Uh, uh, the technology and uh, penetrating the market. So those technology needs to be sold or licensed to the bigger firm. Uh, one great example from pharmaceutical uh, industry is that, you know, uh, the, all of the blockbuster drugs that we see today are, are sold by few of the very big firms. But if we look at the origin of those drugs, so those, those drugs are developed by much, much smaller firms and many, many smaller firms. And even today, we don't see any blockbuster drug in the market who has not passed through licensing process, merger acquisition, or technology uh, uh, transaction process. So, so the value of the also uh, involved in the pharma companies. Yes, absolutely. So, so once you know the, I mean, for starting a technology and establishing a technology, we take help from uh, the patents. One, it becomes a brand. We try to monetize the brand value and extend the life, uh, even after uh, patient expire or we see some some kind of saturation. So, um, so that's that's, that's a brief uh, that what I wanted to mention. And uh, also in different uh, business segment, for example, in an organization, there would be some product line which would be futuristic, some product line which would become stagnant, and some product line Depending on the demand and the but market stability, then you all uh, structure the deals. Yeah. And, and yes, as Scott was mentioning, they uh, outlets and some technology which they are not interested, but they outlets and the technology some Indian firm okay. would be interested. So you, you analyze what is the status of your portfolio, how they're performing. You need futuristic te technology, you do joint venture, you do collaboration, you try to complement your asset. And some technology if it is not performing, you don't keep in that portfolio, keeping in mind your roadmap, future roadmap, you stole that off. Uh, and uh, great money. So this is a 
so this was a great uh, insight from all of you all actually i come from the entertainment sector everybody watches content on uh, netflix amazon theaters so how does it begin for me my ip begins right at the script level if a writer walks in with a script or uh, if somebody comes up with a story so script is a literary aspect of the co copyright and then we enter into numerous uh, agreements contracts negotiations and eventually from the writer's day uh, once if a studio decides that we want to develop this content or make it into a movie or a ott program or whatever after that we enter into i mean on one project i have to make almost 200 agreements which involves all the cast and crew but eventually the uh, chain of title should be clear because how do i monetize my ip by selling it so i will sell it to the tv netflix amazon rights theater the theater is the basic uh, basic large revenue from the where the cost of production is uh, recouped so it's just i mean in a nutshell this is how uh, the work happens in the entertainment industry so we have copyright we have trademark the only thing i'm happy that i don't have patents i have to deal and of course uh, entertainment is supposed to be a very glamorous industry so there is a lot of people handling as well uh, and in my career i must have done almost 30 to 35 uh, feature films so yeah and and in la i have i have studied how to make movies uh, do copyright trademark business structure everything uh, i think uh, in the end everything it works structurally depends on what the market is in need of and what is the money put on the table depending on that we make the budget approach the talent get everything in hand own the ip as a studio and then exploit it because otherwise if your chain of chain of title is not clear no platform will buy it so that's my uh, job on a daily basis and uh, just let me see if i have uh, no i don't think there are any questions so so now now we are open with the question hmm. so like if we have concluded the you know the session of today so thank you so much yeah i would like to really thank uh, ipr gorilla and all the members for uh, coming together and putting putting this up thank you so much and we feel same here and uh, we have a question from mr prak thakre can you please yeah. give some insight on valuation question above on valuation question okay is I... that for me or can you please listen? come in here yeah. and uh, answer parag parag there are couple of yeah. uh, methods yeah. for ip valuation common of the mall is the discounted cash flow okay uh, and that because you when you have a trademark okay that is valued for example 1 million dollar okay and you want to reflect it in the sheet the problem with the standard valuation is that you will reflect that value as it is in the sheet as 1 million dollar uh disregarding the potential of its licensing capabilities or growth this is where discounted cash flow and discounted cash flow actually is a tool that was used for appraisers of real estate <laughs> actually but uh, it was proven uh, very well in ip back in the days and a lot of people particularly in the trademark and uh, the patent system uh, patent industry they rely heavily on discounted cash flow uh, maybe scott can yes. give us more insight because he's the patent expert on the panel here but that's my experience from trademarks copyright and sometimes trade secrets for me uh, the valuation i can just uh, touch base is depending on the story script actors location cost depends on when we are uh, going to launch the content and how much ip have we acquired and how much cost has been invested in there so that on basis of that holistically then the ip accumulated together gets uh, value 
I hope uh, that uh, answers uh, Parag's question. Yeah. 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 And we also okay. thank you, Kareem, as you can see okay. in the chat as well. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us in the panel discussion. Thank you. And we are.